Okay, I think we're there. Hello, can you guys hear me? Oh, look at that. That is nice. Hello, look at that. Volume level. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Deep Astronomy live stream. Today, we're going to be talking about the inflipping. That's a word of the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, we do this every week. We Actually, we do it twice a week. We get together. We talk about whatever interests us. And I, at the top of the stream, let me just tell you first off that I, I got the dates wrong for the uh, next Ast American Astronomical or Astronautical Society uh, hangout. Uh, I thought it was the 18th. Turns out it's this Thursday, the 11th. So if you're one of those guys that happen to pay attention to when I post an event, you'll notice I had to delete the one that was about the decadal survey and replace it with the one on the DART mission, which I'm very excited about. That's coming up in just two days. Same time, uh, as always, we're going to have uh, people who work on the project from uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, as well as I think maybe the project manager, I'm not sure, project scientist. She may be available for us. We didn't get a confirmation yet, but I'm hoping she's there. So we're going to have guests on Thursday uh, where we're going to talk about DART from the people who are getting ready to launch it because it's going up later this month. So that's the double asteroid redirect test mission where they're going to smash into a little tiny binary <laughs> system and see if they can have any effect on it. So that is a change I wanted to let you guys know about next week or this week uh, on Thursday. And then I'm going to do the Decadal Survey Hangout on Tuesday, a week from today. I just haven't created the event yet, but uh, we've got to talk about a lot of stuff going on because the, um, uh, the Decadal Survey uh, report came out late last week so week before last actually so a lot of stuff to talk about <laughs> and like i said nobody really won but everybody won but the big winner was the carl sagan space telescope and i'll tell you what i mean by that when we have the when we have the stream so okay so anyway i am streaming for those of you who are new here for the first time welcome i'm glad you're here if you're watching the vod the video on demand of this stream after the fact also welcome but also know that I'm doing a little bit of chatting up front, and then we'll get to the um, uh, the meat of this in just a little bit. You can fast forward until you start seeing slides. Then you'll know that. Then you'll know that's where the talk begins. I must be a masochist to be doing these these talks twice a week. I have never made so many PowerPoint slides in my life since I started doing this. So, uh, but it's been fun. Um, I enjoy putting together. My, it helps me organize my thoughts. Some of these um, some of these slides are are pretty busy. The ones I'm going to show you today, but um, but uh, hopefully we can get through it okay. So one quick bit of news that I saw coming through my news feed, which uh, is that Hubble seems to be back online. So that's a good thing. The Wildfield Camera Three uh, uh, seems to be back online and taking data. Uh, so that's good news. Hubble is hanging in there. It's trying because we've got. The hang, we got the countdown uh, for JWST underway on December 18th. Hopefully, we could have both space telescopes working at the same time. I, I hope so. Um, so, let's see. I'm looking at the chat here. Somebody's saying things are buffering. Let me just double check my stream. I seem to have good throughput. Um, let me just look at, so tell me in the, in the, the chats, if, uh, things are okay. I'm looking at the chats. Okay. So I think we're all right. Um, if you're having trouble, trouble, try doing a refresh on this. I, I can't, um, I can't, uh, control what everybody's experience is on this, unfortunately. Okay, so I don't know. Let's go ahead and, and get going here. I don't know what algorithm you have chosen to let ruin your life, or at least bias your life. <laughs> but it seems like we live in a day and age when all of us have to make a choice. Who's, whose algorithm or algorithms are we going to succumb to? And in my case, it's hard to be on the internet without being affected by some algorithm. So I have chosen to actively avoid Facebook, aka Meta. And I'm not very active on Instagram either, because I don't want them to know 
more or less everything there is to know about me because they are the most egregious in terms of what they do with my personal data. So I've had to choose Google as the algorithm of my destruction. So I have, so what that means is I subscribe, when I get my news, whenever I say something comes by my news feed, I'm talking about news.google.com. I tend to use that a lot. I, it knows what I'm interested in because I click on all the articles that I'm interested in. And uh, some of this stuff shows up and I'm like, what? I didn't know I was interested in that. But for some reason, I'm interested in some pretty strange things, apparently, according to the algorithm. But of course, a lot of science stuff comes by too. And, and I've noticed over the past year or so, a lot of stories about the Earth's magnetic field. And I got to thinking, you know, I'm reading about, you know, the, what, you know, some of it's just stupid articles, like, is the world coming to an end? Is it another one of those 2012 kind of situations where, if you remember back then, we had a solar max cycle that was approaching and people were worried we were going to lose our civilization because of that. And also the Mayan calendar ending. So, um, I, uh, I've been seeing a lot of these, I've been reading a lot of these articles and then I got to thinking, gee, I'd kind of like to learn a little bit more about this. So I went out and did some research on my own, um, uh, to kind of see what this was all about. And so I thought I'd share it with you because I think you guys might be interested in this too. I wanted to know about this. And so I'm sharing it also with you guys. Um, and while I'm going, so what I'm going to do, the format of this, for those of you who are here for the first time, is I'm going to go through some slides. I have about, I don't know, a bunch. And then I'm going to go through them. And then uh, I'm not going to look at the chat or anything while I do that because it distracts me. And then I'm going to stop and we're going to talk about everything I just said. And if you guys want to comment about specific things or ask a question, then uh, put it in the chat. I'm looking at all the chats from Twitch, Twitter, Facebook. But all I do is stream to Facebook. Okay, I just happen to be able to grab their chat, YouTube and um, Odyssey. So I'm on those platforms. Okay, and I'll see them all. And if you type in on, if you're on YouTube and you type in, I think, question mark, or I'm sorry, colon Q U, I think you get a big red question mark that comes up. And um, that helps me to see that there's a, a question there for me to answer. Otherwise, I just scroll through all of this myself. All right, so let me bring up. My in slight of, oh, one more plug. I'm sorry. And then I'll start. Uh, also, there's a Discord, uh, uh, Deep Astronomy Discord server. The link is in the description box of most of the, on Facebook and, and YouTube, but I know, and maybe Twitch, but um, it will, but at least I know the stream elements will screen, will scroll through on the Twitch chat and give you the link to this. Join the, join the server. Because what you can do if you join the server is you can interact with this stream directly by going into the live stream channel, which some people are already on. I can tell by I can hear them joining. And then when I put my ear, my earphones on, um, we could talk amongst ourselves and it'll go out through the stream and you guys can hear. It's kind of like a call-in show. And people have been doing that for a while. It seems to be working pretty good. That is until somebody um, uh, bombs me with some stuff that I'm probably going to regret with some with some hateful stuff. But until that happens, I would go ahead and join the Discord server and be a part of this hangout. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's, <clears throat> so what I wanted to know about was this magnetic field flipping and flipping. Yes, that's a word. It's not really a word. I'm making it up. But um, it is, there is evidence of some weird stuff going on with the Earth's magnetic field. So I wanted to find out about it. And as I did, I, I learned to stop worrying and love the magnetic field reversals. <coughs> so that is what we're going to talk about here today. And um, so let's start by getting a little educated on the Earth's magnetic field. It is very important for life here on this planet. It surrounds us like a force field, it protects us from radiation and particles that come at us from the sun. Um, and it, it deflects charged particles away, and it is generated deep down in the core of the Earth, and it is not constant. It is constantly changing, and that was one of the things I found really interesting about this little research. So here we go. Where does it comes from? Where does it come from? Here's the Earth, schematic from NASA, uh, showing that there's the Earth's crust, which is about 19 miles thick, 
And then over that, over that's where we live. That's where the continents are. That's where that's where life happens. And then below that is uh, a mantle of hot, viscous, uh, molten rock that that descends about eighteen hundred miles or twenty nine hundred kilometers down to the outer core, which is liquid. It's fourteen hundred miles or twenty two hundred fifty kilometers thick, and it's and it made it's made up mostly of um, iron and nickel. Now these are highly magnetic metals, and we'll learn a bit more about that in just a second. The inner core, however, is about 759 miles or 1,200 kilometers thick. It's solid, and it's also made of iron and nickel, uh, and the metal, it's about as hot as the sun's surface. So you're looking at about 5,500 Kelvin uh, down there in the center of the earth. Very cool, pl uh, very, not a cool place, but it's an interesting place, and it is also very active. Here is what's creating the magnetic field of the earth. If this is a close up of the outer core and the inner core, and you'll see magnetic field lines uh, coming out or into and out of this region. So the interesting part here is these little twirly bits. These little, these, these are convection currents that exist in the molten outer core. And because these are magnetic metals, they move and they, and they, create a magnetic field as they move. But if you, for those of you who have studied electricity and magnetism, anytime you move a magnetic field, you also create an electric current. So electric currents are flowing in here hundreds of miles wide and they're going very fast, thousands of miles an hour. So it's these, can you see my, yeah, I think you can see it. Yeah. My cursor. There is this outer core and these, uh, this convection, these convection zones are creating the magnetic field, and it, go, it travels in like with the direction of these arrows. Okay, so you see, and they're all connected. So this is just the part that's in the inner, the inter, uh, center part of the Earth. Um, the outer part looks like this. As they come out of the Earth's surface, they create these magnetic uh, reconnection lines that go all the way out and then back in toward the poles. That's what generates our magnetic field. Without it, we wouldn't be here. Without it, we couldn't live. Mars doesn't have one of these. Mars is losing its atmosphere. Mars is bombarded with solar radiation all the time. Mars is very uninhabitable. So we end up with this thing called a magnetic dipole that looks a lot like this when it's looked from far away. The part that faces the sun is kind of squashed in from radiation pressure, and you can see the solar wind being deflected around it. And then, of course, it goes off into a long tail on the on the side opposite the sun. And um, so that's all due to the solar wind. Um, but there are opposite. Uh, this is just like a the Earth acts like a big bar magnet. We have a North Pole up in this part and a South Pole down here. And this is this. If you took a bar magnet, one of those those um, little thin ones you could buy at a at a hobby store, and you know you sprinkle iron filings over it and see the magnetic field lines, absolutely the same thing. But it turns out we actually have three North Poles, and we also have three South Poles. <laughs> um, we have the geographic North Pole. This one is not magnetically related at all. This is uh, this 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 North Pole is defined by the spin axis of the Earth. Um, when the Earth turns in its diurnal motion every single day, it does so around this axis. That's what we call the geomagnetic North Pole. Now, anybody who's been a sailor or a pilot, of which I've been both, I've long known that true North was different than magnetic North because they, tr they train you on that uh, for navigation purposes. And the difference is generally allocated by or, or um, indicated by uh, the, the difference between the magnetic pole and the geomagnetic or the geographic North Pole. And there's also magnetic variation that goes on across the globe. I'll get to that in just a minute. But so the North Pole, the geographic North Pole, the actual physical, I'm going to stand on it, North Pole, is not the same as the magnetic North Pole that your compass points to. They're different. And it's because of that roiling inner core with all the convection zones generating the magnetic field. The way these are lined up 
you know, is not going to be identical to the polar axis or the spin axis of the earth. This has got a lot of other things going into it. The, the spin does contribute. It moves the spin of the earth does move this outer core around, but um, it, it's the convection zones that are causing most of it. Oops. And then finally, we have this thing called a North geomagnetic pole. Now, what's the difference? Well, the magnetic pole, I've got it here off to the left. Uh, the magnetic pole is where the, the magnetic field lines converge, um, but, they, uh, but they may not pass directly through the center of the Earth. The geomagnetic pole is a average, kind of a, 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 an average of where the, of, of where the poles do come together and are exactly opposite each other and that do travel straight through the Earth. And that's different from the magnetic pole. Um, the geomagnetic poles are more reliable because they are a, sort of a, almost like a moving average of the, of all the uh, magnetic field lines. And um, they move, they don't change as much. Okay. So I, ho I hope I made that a little bit clearer. The magnetic, the North magnetic pole is just where magnetic field lines converge, but they don't go through the center of the earth. And the geomagnetic pole is where the two north and south poles are exactly opposite, and they're called antipodal, and they cross through the center of the Earth. Okay, so that location is slightly different. Right now, it's over here, more or less by Greenland, and this is uh, the North Magnetic Poles right now, right over the North Pole, heading towards Asia. I'll show you more of that in just a minute. Because here, well, how about now? <laughs> so they move. The magnetic poles move. Now, here's a map from uh, the British Geological Survey society that show that in the that shows the the tra the path of the magnetic poles since 1900 now in the geomagnetic pole has moved much 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 smaller amounts it's down here it's kind of hard to see um so since 1900 the north magnetic pole has wandered slowly toward the earth it's right right now it's about here where that red dot is and it's heading over a um, little bit further, a um, little bit further uh, east, I believe. So they move all the time. They're always in motion, and they have always moved ever since the Earth existed. And poles also flip sometimes. There is plenty of evidence that they've done this several times in the past, and uh, they tend to happen more or less every half million years or so, 450,000 years. Um, and they look at the the magnetic record is kind of this, um, if you look at, uh, if you do mining of ores and stuff that are magnetic in nature and you look at their at their magnetic field um, configuration, you, you can kind of map out the past of the magnetic field of the earth. The last reversal was about 780,000 years ago. And this is the interesting part. So we seem to be ready to have one. If they occur every, every 450,000 years and the last one was 780,000 years ago, then we ought to be due. That's what scientists are saying. Oops. Okay. Go back to this. They also, the magnetic fields also change shape and strength. Here is a really cool animation from NASA uh, that shows the variations of the magnetic field in the Van Allen belts as as it interacts with the solar wind. You can see that it goes through periods of weakening, like in, in 2003, and it also goes through periods of strengthening as well. So um, uh, the Van Allen belts just capture solar particles. Uh, they go down the magnetic field lines. And um, and right now, the measurements, the way the, one of the biggest satellites that are measuring our magnetic field is ESA's swarm uh, constellation of satellites. And they're, no, and they're, they are measuring a decrease in the magnetic field at a rate of about 5% every 100 years. So are we about to inflipinate? Well, nobody's sure why they flip. And this picture here on the side is really wild. Uh, on the right here is uh, also from NASA. This is uh, what in, the magnetic field looks like in normal times. You have a well-defined north uh, pole, a well-defined South Pole. <laughs> but during a reversal, you get this. You get several North Poles, several South Poles. You also get uh, all this confusion of magnetic field lines uh, all going anywhere. And they come and they go, and they're much, much weaker 
than the magnetic field when things are not when things are not um, reversing. Um, so during a reversal, the magnetic field does weaken, but it does not go away. That's important. It's always there. Maybe it's down to only 10% of what it would be at full strength, but it never goes to zero. Um, and so when I say it falls to 10% of normal, I actually mean falls down to 10% um, of what normal, not 10% minus 100%, not 90%. Uh, so that's a little bit strange wording. Uh, magnetic poles appear, may even appear at the equator. And we'll get uh, simultaneous north and south poles, as you see in this picture here. And reversals, this, this is a really interesting point. Reversals can be temporary and they can be incomplete. They're called excursions, magnetic excursions. You'll see a change and then they, they come back from where they were again. Um, and those happen a lot more frequently and they're not as... Um, long lasting. So let's talk about this. Now, sorry about the slide. <laughs> I know there's a lot of bullet points in here, but I wanted to be able to uh, get through all this information. Don't get mad at me because I'm an American and I will say this stupidly, but I think you pronounce this La Champ uh, is how you pronounce that word. Not less, not last champ. It's La Champ. And they're called there. That's the word that was the last event that we recorded that was recorded that was a magnetic excursion now like i said these are temporary they're shorter lived and um uh but they do cause significant uh changes in intensity of the magnetic field uh and they, they tend to go from a few centuries to tens of thousands of years and they happen about 10 times more frequently than pole reversals do an excursion can reorient Earth's magnetic poles as much as 45 degrees from their previous position and reduce their strength of the field by up to 20%. Um, excursion events are generally regional rather than global. There have been three significant excursions in the past 70,000 years. The, there was one in uh, the Norwegian Greenland Sea event, which la which was 64, well, 65,000 years ago. The Le Champ event, which was 42,000, uh, 41,000 years ago. Um, and the, and so this, this last one that was 49,000, 41,000 years ago, it lasted a thousand years and the, the polarity change itself, the actual polarity change from North to South lasted 250 years, it took a thousand years for the whole event to go down and, uh, back up again. Um, it was considered a failed reversal because it went back to where it was, but it was the fastest. This was one of the fastest ways in which this can happen. So we're talking time scale of a thousand years and that's being quick. So because of the decreasing magnetic field that's being measured now, remember I said it was going down about 5% per 100 years. Uh, some, some people are suggesting that we may have one within 2000 years. So we could be on, we could be due for a flip or we could be due for a magnetic excursion. Oh, darn it. That's really too bad. I, hang on just a sec. I really... I really like this. So I need to, for some reason, um, this, this image gives my computer or gives slides a hard time. Let me, I'm just going to quickly load it up again. Okay, there we go. So this is an animated GIF. Unfortunately, it's really big. This showed data from ESA's swarm satellite that shows the magnetic field, uh, poles the north pole moving so you could see that it's it started from around 1830 they they've got data from that uh from from sea records uh going all the way to present day and the north pole is currently moving towards asia and the south pole is leaving antarctica and heading towards australia so this is the rate at which the north pole is moving I like this animation because it's, you know, it kind of shows you the the path and the trajectory in an animated way. And again, this is from ESA's Swarm Satellite. Okay, so. I'll get back to that slide in a minute. So I showed you what is going on in the center of the Earth. We know what causes the magnetic field of the Earth. We know that it's moving constantly. It's also changing in strength and orientation. 
all the time. Very normal. It's happened since the Earth began. And um, we know that the poles are currently on, in motion. And we know that it's weakening. The magnetic field strength of the Earth is going down very small amounts, 5% every 100 years. So that's what we know is happening now. But you can imagine, as with all things predictive, when we, especially when you don't know what causes the magnetic field to flip, predicting this kind of thing is hard. But here's one thing we can be very sure of. Whether it's flipping or not, and I'll get to what the scientists think at the end of this, um, it's not going to happen quickly. Nothing here is on a time scale of, you know, a couple of years or even instantaneous. I remember... I remember when I was in high school, I read a science fiction book called The Hab Theory, H-A-B Theory. It's still out in print, and it I thought it was good at the time. Uh, I've been meaning to reread that because one of the things I'm doing is I'm going back to reread a lot of the science fiction I read as a teenager to see if it's still any good and compare it with what I think now. Um, anyway, that whole book's premise was on the idea that the Earth's magnetic field would flip. And it was one of those doomsday scenarios. And then the last, I'll never forget it because I was, I was so impressionable at the time. One of uh, the last sentence in the book was, as this guy was explaining his theory on the, on the, he was trying to convince humanity that this was happening because they didn't believe it. Uh, <laughs> big surprise there. The last sentence of the book was, and then the light went out everywhere. <laughs> and that's how it ended. <laughs> so. Um, It'll be nothing like that I, uh, because the nature of the problem is such that this happens over eons, right? It happens over um, uh, millennia, not even centuries. It happens over thousand-year timescales. So we've seen that it's wandering and we see that it's decreasing in time. What do we make of that? Well, it could be we're heading for one of those excursions, like in the Lachan event, where 41,000 years ago, it went down 45 degrees. The poles shifted 45 degrees and then went back. And they went down in, in strength by 20%. That's one thing that could happen. The other thing that happened is we could have an in full inflipination in which the 100,000 time period year within a several tens of thousands of years, the North Pole becomes the South Pole, South Pole becomes the North Pole. And in that process, you get that messy configuration of magnetic field lines that are very, very weak but not zero magnetic field. So those are what we're looking at here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit first about what could happen to us if a pole reversal happens. Well, we can't predict exactly what would happen to humanity, life, human beings, because we haven't been through one yet. The last one was 780,000 years ago. So we don't know, but we did go through the Lachan event. And so that was 40, I mean, hum, not us, not even civilization, but human beings went through it and um, seemed to survive okay. So we can make that assumption. But however, we do know, however, that many animals depend on sensing the magnetic field to migrate, right? We know, we, we, we well, we don't know, but we suspect that many animals use the magnetic field of the earth to get around places, especially when they've got long distances to travel. Um, so the main threat to us is, is I think most, can can sort of assume is that we are uh because we're such an electronically reliant civilization a weak magnetic field and any subsequent and any subsequent solar storms that happen during the reversal could cause a lot of damage to our infrastructure so that's one thing that could affect us it would be a lot like having a direct cme hit the earth at full magnetic field strength um, but we would be uh, susceptible to much smaller magnetic storms that hit the Earth. So it would be very similar to a space, space weather events. Um, and, of course, they'll be more pronounced in the regions where the, where the magnetic field is weak. Remember that big, messy picture? There's a lot of places where uh, charged particles can get through because there's so many poles at that time. So we could have a lot of economic headaches. But it's important to remember that the magnetic field is still going to protect us, okay? Um, and there may still be some amount of particulate radiation that makes it down to Earth. So it could happen, but uh, the the effect on Earth in life wouldn't. It would not be an extinction event, okay? Is one way we can look at it. 
Um, and because, like I said, the magnetic field becomes jumbled, you get all of these. Um, you could have the North Pole on the equator. Wouldn't that be weird, right? You could have northern lights in Hawaii, right? So, I mean, you could get those everywhere because of all the bump jumbled fields. Speaking of which, this came uh, via Third Rock Astronomy. Uh, he posted this on the Discord server. Well done. Um, I believe he's up in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, there's some aurora that he photographed. So one question we could ask is, well, what's going to happen to them in a changing magnetic field situation? And they, if the, I mean, if the magnetic fields, north and south poles are moving, then so should the charged particles that are accelerating around them. They should also move. Um, so the North Pole is moving across the geomagnetic pole right now, which we just saw, uh, which means they, they should become more visible in Siberia than they are right now, and as well as northern Russia, and then less so around the U.S.-Canadian border. So Third Rock, who took this picture, um, would probably see less of this as the pole moved uh, further and further away. Okay, um, But there's some evidence that say that the aurora follow... Not the magnetic poles, but the geomagnetic poles, the ones that are much more stable. Remember, I showed you those, the ones that don't move as much. Those poles um, may be where a lot of these aurora hang around uh, more. And if that's true, then we're not going to see much change, much change at all. So that's pretty cool. Um, so, I mean, it's one of the things that we could we could see uh, going forward with, with aurora. So. Is a geomagnetic reversal happening or not? Okay, so the first thing I have here is look at the USGS website. So let me pull that up. Um, hang on just a second while I do that. Uh, let's see. Excuse me while I... While I uh, there it is. Okay. So the USGS, there it is. <laughs> All right, now you can't really read this. Let me see if I can make it embiggened. So this is from the U.S. Geological Survey. Are we about to have a magnetic reversal? They say almost certainly not. <laughs> Since the invention of the magnetometer in the 1830s, the average intensity of the magnetic field has decreased by about 10%. We know from paleomagnetic records that the intensity of the magnetic field decreases by as much as 90% as the Earth's surface as during a reversal. But those same paleomagnetic records also show that the field intensity can vary significantly without a without resulting in a reversal. Um, so so just because we are seeing a reduced intensity of the magnetic field, it doesn't mean that a reversal is about to occur. However, the decrease in intensity is not a dramatic departure from normal. We see this all the time. Um, uh, it can get stronger again in the not-so-distant future. So predicting all this, they're saying, is really, really hard. Um, so that's that, that. most scientists seem to think this. OK, so there is the there's the um, that's what they say. Uh, pole reversals don't happen overnight. Like I just said, thousands of years for the fastest ones. But most scientists, as far as I can tell, don't seem to think that one is imminent, although we could be on the verge of a magnetic excursion, which sounds like fun. OK, so those are my slides. And um, I feel better. I mean, I was a little bit, I have to admit, I was like, well, what does this mean? I mean, you know, the, you've heard me preach many, many times, especially when I'm talking about terraforming Mars, um, just how important the magnetic field is. We don't have any experience as a, as a civilization living outside of that protective shield um, for very, very much at all. And that worries me. You know, I don't, I mean, yes, we can build leaded suits and leaded shelters and all of this kind of stuff, but uh, one screw up and boom, you know, we're dead. It's dangerous out there. So the magnetic field is very, very important to us. And so I, I, so I heard about this moving and I heard about this decretion in the, in the uh, intensity of the magnetic field. And I'm thinking, wow, man, this is something to worry about. So I looked into it and um, that's what I came up with. I don't think there's any real reason to get super afraid right now. Um, uh, I think that we could, um, worst case, if something sudden, and by sudden I mean over the course of a couple hundred years, happens, then our electronics may 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 suffer for it, and some animals who are 
um, trying to use the magnetic field for navigation may suffer, but, um, you know, that's about it. Long, fortunately for us, long gone are the days we're needing magnetic compasses to do navigation. It would wreak havoc if we were still in the 1850s and trying to get from one spot to another using a magnetic uh, compass uh, on a ship. Now we all have GPS and, and um, you know, although presumably they would be vulnerable, right? They're within the magnetic field of the earth, protected by a lot of charged particles. So they could be vulnerable. So they might need to be hardened. Who knows? Um, so the, that's the biggest risk is with most things like this and with most things involving the sun, um, it's our electronics and our grids, things like that, that are the most at risk. So I'm feeling pretty okay about stuff. Let me look at the chat. Oh, wait, let me also... Let's see, oh, we got a couple people there. Peter and Tony are around. Let me put on my. Hey guys, are you there? Oh, you got your mics muted. Okay, well, if you want to say something, let me know. You're not being streamed right now, so I will. Uh, I'll add you later. Oh, hey, hey, Peter, it's good to hear you. Okay, um, let me get to a couple of chats here. This is uh, from Vibes. The three always throws me when people use threes in their handles. Thousands of years of having a jumbled magnetic field with exposure to solar radiation and increased danger to electronics. That's a disaster in slow motion. Very true. Um, um, and from PB, uh, particles will flush into poles, hence more interference with our magnetic field. Um, um, particles will flush in. I don't know how much it would interfere with it, but, but it would certainly follow those field lines. Um, Pyro's trying to figure out the question thing. Sorry, I don't know why it's, it could be, it could be your browser. Uh, maybe it's a browser thing because Christina or crazy, crazy Christiana can do it. Um, would a decreased magnetic field strength cause Aurora to move closer to the equator? Yes. So um, that's possible. Um, that one um, image I showed with uh, jumbled magnetic field lines uh, basically says it all. I wonder if I can bring it. I wonder if I can bring just that image up. Let me see. Well, I'll worry about it later. Um, Peter, do you have something you wanted to add? Let me let me add you to the stream. Um, there you go. Just printing about what you're working on the, the picture. Huh? Uh, I was thinking about uh, what you're working on with the pit, trying to get up the picture. That's all I was. Uh, oh, oh, that's what you were. Oh, about. I see. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> so let's see. A couple more. J uh, Jam in eighty three. Is Mars going through a magnetic field reversal? Absolutely not, <laughs> because they don't have a magnetic field. Um, they don't have anything like what's in the core of our Earth. Um, uh, so they have a magnetic field, but it's extremely weak, and they don't have a dynamo with them. Remember those convection. Uh, uh, cells I showed you and the earth, the earth's core is very hot. It's temperature of the sun, you know, 50, 5,500 or so degrees, uh, Kelvin. So it's pretty hot down there. <clears throat> so let's see. And also you're asking, um, is it possible, is it possible to use magnetic reconnection, uh, to create thrust for spacecraft? Um, hmm. well, you'd have to shoot out some kind of stream of charged particles and mm -hmm. then the reconnection would have to happen or actually you would want a a, a a a disconnection to cause the or at least an expanding field line to push against so i don't think it'd make a very good thrust um you might be able oh. to push against it with some charged particles but you'd want a steady magnetic field not one that's wildly fluctuating uh to be able to if push it was against. a small spacecraft uh yeah the acceleration would be enough but the engines would be bigger than the spacecraft well, we don't I think. know that i mean no one's ever tried it but I, the principle yeah. would need to be that you know you need something to push against so the magnetic field will be something you push against the charged particles will be those things pushing against you so i don't know um yeah I, they would I, be I pushing be against very, i don't think it'd be a deep very good space around so Tony, I have a question for uh, you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, I recall 
not only that uh, the Earth's magnetic field was flipping, but I, I'm in your research. Did you find anything out about the sun reversing its? Oh yes, uh, that happens too. Um, yeah, flipping. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering if there was any correlation. I mean, like we we can't. Like, it seems like the uh, sun's magnetic field was flipping much more often than yes. the Earth's magnetic field. Yes. And uh, I, I don't know if uh, I, how much do you uh, or, or how much was uh, did you get up to with that or um, well, all I can do, do you have anything to? All I can do is go against my. Um uh experience on this so i was lucky enough to have worked in solar physics for the first part of my career so about 14 years and as we know the solar cycle goes through an 11 year cycle uh, and that cycle is magnetically driven and it is essentially the process of flipping the magnetic field so the solar cycle uh, min and max is involved it's the act of the solar um, magnetic field flipping so it does that every 11 years. Uh, very predictable because it's a, you know, it's a cycle that corresponds with the sunspots and a lot of other solar activity. And um, so to answer your question, is it correlated to Earth's magnetic field? No. Uh, no one yes. knows what causes the Earth's magnetic field to reverse. Um, but it happens on such a long time scale and over such a very long period, right? We're looking... <laughs> Well, they said about every half million years it occurs, but we haven't had one now for 250 years past that. 250,000 years yeah. past that. So, and, so, and the and our records of that are are through the uh, the oceanic plates mostly, right? Is that? Uh, I didn't. Uh, I tried to find how they looked. I, I was running out of time, and I wanted to answer that question. How do we know the history of the magnetic field over time? And and uh, all I could get out. Yeah. real quickly was this ferro metal yeah, the metals. Ferro, the metals the magnetic metals you can yeah so so where the, the cease for for spreads that's where our record is but there's also records on the continental crust where that say you have the same con uh mineral concentrates so that they they blocked them them in as well so we know that uh okay. they, what we can tell from from that record is that the Earth's magnetic field was present, and we can see the uh, delineation with stratified layers, right? So, so how steep was the magnetic field, and how close to the uh, um, to the magnetic north or north, north magnetic south was? But uh, but even that throws things in because we know that the magnetic uh, field fluctuates uh, from north to south and it doesn't necessarily coincide with the uh, axis of rotation, right? That's right. Uh, yeah, the, the, the axis of the rotation other has very, seems to have very little. What I wanted to, uh, to ask you about uh, was, uh, did you do any uh, research into whether Jupiter's uh, magnetic field uh, and oh, man. I was uh, just trying to get through Earth. Um, yeah, uh, no. In fact, Juno is teaching us about that right now. Um, yeah. I think I think that we're learning that information as we speak. Um, so, um, I think I need to look up some Juno stuff about what Jupiter's magnetic field is doing. I think I think that's yeah. work I mean, that's now being done. Yeah. These are these are things that, I, that some of them I know and some of them I don't. But you know, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's why we that's why we have these chats. If you ask me, right? Yeah, exactly. We, you know, I wanted to learn about this, and so I thought I'd share it with you, and uh, we'll talk about this and maybe find yeah. stuff out together. So, uh, PB is also um, commenting. I wonder if you do a study of cancer prevalence in the north, where aurora reside versus the equator. Uh, I mean, the idea that magnetic fields interacting with high power photons but surely some go through yeah um a lot of cosmic rays and um and, and other high gamma a lot of charged high energy uh particles do get caught up in the in the aurora but i don't know if anybody's done a correlation of of like cancer with that and stuff like that mm. um so And also PB saying, PB is commenting a lot. Uh, birds would have a tough time traveling. 
Oh, may it whales magnet. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we're still getting a handle on that, right? Where, yeah. uh, and, you know, what animals use the magnetic field. So dolphins use sonar, so the bots mm -hmm. that may be affected. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. I'm just going through, um, uh, Dan from Canada, uh, Aurora displays could be global then yeah you boy sure think about it wouldn't yeah it? um uh let me just work a little bit harder to get that picture up because i really think that's cool um let me just it won't take but just a minute Oh, here it is. Yeah, good. All right. <laughs> I mean, um, that's crazy. I mean, look at the difference there. So imagine every um, everywhere where you see a, a pole, uh, there could be um, there could be aurora happening there. Um, so that's really crazy. get rid of this yeah i mean this this sort of says it all <laughs> right here <laughs> during the reversal this is what happens so you have this period of of like utter confusion um uh, at first so and this is like i said you know you're looking at centuries and millennia this is going to be, be taking place so that, that's that's a crazy pick right there Let's see. PB's commenting again. Um, so uh, amazing, we are in this cooking rock saved by mass holding an atmosphere and a magnetic field shielding us from the sun's high energy gamma rays and X-ray bombardment. I mean, I know, you know, these mm -hmm. are, this is, it's nothing short of, you know, a miraculous that we have all these conditions. Um, I use that term tongue in cheek, okay? But, you know, it's, uh, yeah. We live on a very, very privileged place. And so um, how common is this would be a really good question, you know. Magnetic fields are, I think, vital uh, for life on a planet, especially if you're going to start from nothing. But if you want to just thrive like we want to do with Mars, we want to just go over there and live, well, we're going to have to carry around quite a bit of shielding uh, with us to do this. So it's may, that's why I'm very pessimistic, extremely pessimistic that we're ever going to turn uh, Mars into something that we can we can terraform and, and call it you know Earth like um, we can live there and we can colonize the place sure but we can't it won't be like it won't be a replacement for Earth by any stretch of the imagination no uh, not Dan's for a long time at least yeah so we would have to cover over a lot of the outside area as well. But we could live in cave systems or prefabs or things like that. Sure. Yeah. But as Fraser Kim points out, what kind of life is that? You know? Um, yeah. yeah. Who wants to live in a cave all their life? And if you go outside, you die. So, I mean, that's yeah. what kind of life is that? So, uh, Dan is asking which magnetic pole does a compass point to? Um, the, the magnetic North Pole uh, lines with that, not the one that moves most, not the geomagnetic pole. Uh, the geomagnetic pole is sort of a moving average. Um, but I don't know if you've ever tried to learn how to read a nautical or an aeronautical chart, uh, the paper versions used to have uh, magnetic variation lines. So you, when you plotted your course on a compass, you would use magnetic north, but you would plot a course and you'd have to add or subtract what you would see on a compass by those magnetic variation lines and sometimes they could be several degrees so you really need and those needed to be updated back when they were printing charts every six months because that's how fast the magnetic field changed so you're using that magnetic field reference not the geomagnetic reference as i understand it because of the change the changing the other change happens very slowly and uh uh is much more stable but i don't think it's stronger well, That's we did question. have a sort of trail run last year with humans living in, well, 
what amounts to their own houses and apartments. So it can be done for months on end. You're talking about like one of those habitat things? Yeah. Yeah, and oh, yeah. to be quite honest, I'm thinking the Martian uh, compounds will be a lot larger than most people's houses and apartments. So you're saying it's going to be okay to, to just, you know, won't be so bad. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well. I'm... It'll be reasonable. It wouldn't be, uh, okay. you know, exciting. <laughs> you still? Well, you're it still, you're probably still like will that. be, but in other ways. So the question becomes, yeah. okay, in that kind of situation, <laughs> how much does our humanity kick in? And we have grown up under open skies uh, throughout all of our evolution. What's that going to do to us uh, right. in terms of always being inside of an enclosed environment? Well, um, we'll, we'd need vitamin D. <laughs> Plus, it's well, further away well, okay. from the Earth as but well. Be, so, we any more than bit. that is my boy, though. I, I think, I think, I think this is a bigger deal <laughs> than you're thinking. Because you know, yes, you could go there for a month, a year, even five yeah. years, and chill and hang out on Mars. Assuming after that you could come home uh, and and be okay, which is not uh, which is not at all settled. I mean, it's not at all clear that we can go to Mars for five years, come back here, and just be fine. Yeah. But but assuming you can, then that's a very different situation than well, being there forever and never coming home. Dude, you only be talking yeah. about to. 18 months, is it, to start with? Yeah, because no, okay. the travel time to and from Mars and then the state to wait for the right orbit is about 18 months. Yeah, we're having two different conversations. Something like that. I'm with you uh, on that. Everything you're saying there, Yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Course. And the last, and the last, uh, what, two years? Uh, I mean, we've had times where uh, you were, you know, have to put on a mask when you go out in public. And I mean, this yeah. is, it, and we're talking this on steroids in order to, to live on Mars. So, I mean, for myself, uh, you know, the last two years with, with lockdown uh, is peanuts compared to what we're, we're dealing with when we're talking about going to Mars. You talk about yeah. That kind of situation, you, you, the closest we have here on Earth or is the International Space Station and uh, the polar station on on uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. uh, the South Pole, right? And the, and the Mars trail bases, which are in Greenland and Hawaii, I think, and various other parts of the world. And I know yeah. uh, possible colonists for the Moon and Mars went to Iceland to spend time in caves. Yeah. I mean, to simulate so, that that experience. I, yeah. I don't know if we're, if we're psychologically uh, built for that. I mean, if you're interested in what it's going to be like, and I mean, it's somewhat like, and then you have to look at, at what they do with the South Pole Station where you uh, when they overwinter, right? And there's just a small fraction of... Uh, uh, well, these... But you um, can't go outside uh, for, yeah. for, for, for more than a, uh, you know, a couple of minutes. And, and even if you do, you have to suit up, right? You really do yeah, have to suit that, up. That's what they're doing at these isolation stations. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, so we're kind of getting off topic here. Uh, the Mars... Uh, that that's a different that's a different topic so let's let's move on uh hans is yeah. here so welcome hans if you want to say something and michael myers here too so mayor so uh join in if you guys have something to say michael myers uh no. thank you run yeah if you got a comment or you yeah. want to say something just blurt it out and uh you're being streamed so we'll hear it i want to get to this My comment. Original comment can you hear me i can go ahead yes. michael. um was that somebody commented that the magnetic field is protecting us from X-rays and gamma rays, and I don't think it is. It's only charged particles. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's true. Um, the atmosphere is protecting us from those things. Um, yeah. The uh, the ozone. Uh, I believe it's the ozone layer, mm -hmm. right? That's that's most. At least it keeps the shorter, the higher um, frequency particles from getting there. So you're right about that. Uh, Di Theodo, is that right? Uh, his comment, it's a good question. Is there fluid dynamics involved in this flipping? 
uh, because of the molten nickel core? Mm -hmm. And if so, uh, are there any ongoing simulations? That's a good question. And yes, of course, that was, I think, the, the source of that graphic I showed you was the output of a, of a simulation. Um, the problem with these models is that they have inputs and then they come out with some outputs that show a magnetic field reversal, but um, they don't have the causes of their inputs yet. They just put them in and watch what would happen based on everything we know about the Earth's core and, and the, the interaction with the sun and all of these things. What would the magnetic field reversal look like and how long would it take? Those they can simulate. And that's what I've kind of showed you in various pictures through this uh, through this hangout. Um, but they're almost certainly uh, working on the, simula the the environment of that. What isn't, I'm sorry, the simulations for that. And what, But what isn't being uh, understood very well is what causes it in the first place. It, it would stand to reason that because the source of this magnetic field is in a liquid molten core with an, uh, a solid core in the center, a very dense uh, nickel core, um, all of these things moving around the earth spinning, going around the sun, uh, all these sort of angular momentum things that are happening on the earth itself would certainly kind of, I don't know if sloshing around is the right term, but you know, you'd move this magnetic material around quite a bit. Uh, and sooner or later on geologic timescales, you get a, a sort of different sort of, uh, turbulence pattern that might cause the magnetic field to, to flip. This is me being a kindergarten knowledge level of this stuff. I, I have no idea if it's even close to right to say that, but it's the cause I think that's got a lot of people um, flummoxed. Yeah, but the nature of the field, the flipping, what will happen when it does? That seems well understood by these simulations that you're talking about. So, so that's good. Um. Okay. Let's see here. Hans is on. Okay. Yeah, actually, Tony, I have an answer to the question about uh, how you detect how the magnetic field changes over time. Okay, good. And welcome, Hans. It's good to hear your voice. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. glad you're here. Go ahead. Yeah, so if, if you think... Um, so the Earth's core and the mantle is generating the magnetic field. Uh, and then the uh, the tectonic plates are moving. So if you think about it like uh, an old tape recorder, oh, yeah. then you are moving the the Earth's uh, crust over the magnetic field. And then when the magnetic field changes, it's just like when you record voice on a uh, cassette tape. So it's, it's kind of the same that you can then detect over time how uh, the magnetic field has changed. So you could see that, mm. it, so the, it's being recorded, like you say, like a like a cassette tape, on the in the crust of the Earth. Mm -hmm. really Particularly in the oceanic crust, because it's hotter, uh, so it's above its Curie temperature. As it cools down, the magnetic field gets locked into the rocks. Oh wow! Thank you. I did not understand that. So that's that's really interesting. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah. Man, I'm loving these hangouts. I'm loving where these things are going. This is the this is what I had in mind when I started doing yeah. this. So thank you guys. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pyro is commenting. Uh, do people really think that the needle reading and on the compass will be pointing towards magnetic north? Uh, am I missing something? It, well, it does. It aligns with the magnetic field, the parallel magnetic fields uh, on the surface, and does point towards north. So but it's magnetic north, not, not, um, geo, um, um, true north. geographic north, true north. Right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. And, uh, John Suffol. Yay. Uh, species of uh, human John. have been on the planet for several million years. So our ancestors already lived through a few magnetic flips. Um, yeah, I suppose, I, I don't know. It's funny. I always hear different numbers for how long human beings have been around, but the, the genus Homo, which is, I guess where we started, uh, was from about 
uh, a million years ago. So we would have gone through yeah. uh, one flipping at that time and several uh, excursions during that time. Um, I get the sense that it's not all that harmful. To, the fact that the magnetic field doesn't go away, I think, is the thing we all need to remember, <laughs> uh, regardless yeah. of its field strength. And we would be more susceptible, like I said, during a solar activity cycle that's very high, and we have a lot of Earth-directed uh, geomagnetic or uh, heliomagnetic storms. But um, I don't think it's any kind of extinction. I, I, from what I could find out, I don't think anyone attributes any magnetic pole reversal to an extinction event. Um, it's been yep. more of a, um, you know, like Mike and, and Hans were saying, more of a traditional recorded, things as recorded well. Recorded activity in the crust that you can pick up and and and, yeah. and read from the fossil record or the geological. But record. if there was an extinction event, uh, there were additional things on top of that as well. I believe. I'm sorry, I was reading this comment. Say that again, uh, Peter. And if the, I believe I remember reading uh, something about an extinction event during a magnetic flip, uh, but it uh, the time period also had additional events going on at the same time. Yeah, I couldn't find anything that collaborated that. So uh, yeah, it was just it, it, yeah. it stands to reason the last one we had was 780 thousand years ago. That's pushing it. Right. I mean, depending on mm -hmm. what you define as human beings um, and, and when we started, I think there's a lot of error bars there. And when you start counting human beings, yeah. uh, we've probably only been through one actual flipping. Um, there's been mm -hmm. several of these excursions. Charlie is commenting, uh, the atmosphere is doing most of the protection. I suspect the magnetic field is protecting the atmosphere from the solar wind. Right. And that was um, that was uh, just clarified uh, just now. So, yes, that's right. Um, the uh, charged particles, the ones that interact with magnetic fields are what's mostly diverted away, the solar wind itself. You saw that compressed view of the of the uh, magnetic field lines of Earth that face the sun and the long tail of them stretching out from the solar wind uh, from the mm -hmm. side that faces away. Uh, let's see. Third Rock, you're back. I just showed your picture, by the way. Uh, okay, I'm back. About Sorry about that, Tony. But uh, the big amateur telescope meeting is also very every Tuesday noon my time. Well, I don't blame you, man. I'm glad you showed up. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Uh, Elite Geeks is commenting. Last shift of the... Am I saying that right, by the way? Lachon? Is that right? Uh, Lachon. Lachon event, Lachon. Uh, uh, which occurred between... The S and the P are just about silent. Lachon. Okay. So this all. Yeah, because an American looking at that would go last champ, and that would just make everybody cringe. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I love, I love your. Yeah, you, you're my most wife Charlotte the is from S the, and the P, really. Yeah, my. Uh, well, yeah, your, your lips make make up the whole word. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Is, oh, I'm hearing a. Starting to hear an echo. Um, last yeah. shift was uh, in the Lachon event, which occurred between this time period and lasted a thousand years. Magnetic field was six percent of current levels during. Yes, we we. Uh, I think I, I I talked about that in my slides. Um, Charlie has a question. Uh, the direction of the local magnetic field is locked into hot material. This is frequently studied in the archaeology of excavated fire rings. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, looks like you guys are just struggling with getting the question mark down up there. Here's one from, uh, you can just do this too. This is what uh, Jammin83 does, just several question marks. Uh, do birds of any type of mag, uh, do, do birds any type of magnetic elements or properties in their bodies or brain, which enables them to sense magnetic fields or is it the detection of charge in the atmosphere? That's an open question. I don't think people know. Um, I, I think people mm -hmm. are, are trying to study this. Um, it's an interesting theory, but no one's even sure. Like I've always wanted to know how monarch butterflies know how to, they, they travel over several generations, you know, from all the way from Canada down to, uh, is it Mexico or South America? I forget how far they go. I think it's Mexico. And they just have this amazing journey that takes several of their generations mm -hmm. of, of butterflies to do this. 
I don't know how they find their way around. Um, and there are these geese that actually fly. I couldn't believe when I saw this on like a BBC show. There are these geese that fly over the Himalayas. <laughs> I mean, they just fly over yeah. it. And, and how they find their way around there. Not only the altitude is one that's just amazing all by itself, yeah. but I mean, and they don't go like through mountain passes where it's, it's, uh, you know, lower altitude and they don't have to worry about getting so high. They go over the freaking divide. Yeah. I could believe when I saw that, that was like one of those BBC things, you know, David Attenborough and, and those amazing shows they do. I was like, whoa, it takes, you know, they have to plan it. They try, sometimes they try several times, but they eventually get across the Himalayas. And wow, that has me away. any flock actually flown over Himalaya itself? Huh? Because there's a range of Himalayas, but oh, wow. the mount, the biggest mountain is called Himalaya. No. Yeah. Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah. Or K1. Yeah, no, I don't know about uh, that. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm not too all right. Am I excited about JWST? Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know that being flipped. Yes. But let me, I want to show you something real quick that I just, uh, I was following um, uh, Amber um, Strawn, I believe her name is. Uh, she's, I used to work with her at Goddard. And let's see, we see what JWST, they have this really cool website now I want to show you JWST Countdown. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Here it is, web countdown. Let me just show it to you real quick. Oh, no, that's not it. Um, Since you're looking for it, I'll say that uh, Lucy got off to a flying start and is off to the Trojans and, uh, well, the other ones, uh, the Greek and Roman asteroids. So... All right, so here you go. Here's their count. So go, if you go good. to uh, jwst.nasa.gov and then you go over to the countdowns page, they have this uh, gives you the um, uh, countdown in our days, hours, minutes, seconds. So that's pretty cool. That's new. I didn't know yeah. they had this. So that's pretty cool. And um, I'm also um, working on my T-shirt. I hope to have it out this week so we can we can uh, we can have that to to look forward to as well. I think it's a pretty cool shirt actually. Um, so yes, I'm very excited about that. Yes, and and like you were saying, Lucy is on its way. They still have mm -hmm. that solar panel issue, but um, uh, things are working. Things are going, and Hubble's back. That's another big piece. I, won I wonder if Lucy will find diamonds in those asteroids. Probably not, but you know. Yeah, I don't know. It's wor worth the headline. Yeah, it just writes itself. I did not. Dis this is from Charlie. Did I have I discussed the lab experiments to recreate the geomagnetic dynamo using large rotating spheres of molten sodium? No, I had did not. Dis I just wanted to get a uh, the basics down, and it took me um, over an hour uh, uh, just to do that. So yeah, I didn't go into any of that. And uh, as both Mike and uh, and Hans pointed out, there's a lot I don't know. So there, you know, they added in a lot of this fossil record and where the magnetic field is stored. I love the idea of it being like a tape, uh, magnetic tape. <laughs> I love that idea of the crust sort of recording all of this as the as it travels across the. Uh, what is that? What is that? The not the convection layer, but the um, that zone between the outer core and the crust. I forgot what it's called now. Um, anyway, that's all liquid, and uh, it also moves <laughs> back and forth. So, um, asthenosphere. Asthenosphere. Well, I don't know. Um, Hang on, I'll show you. I'll tell you exactly mm -hmm. what it was. Let me, uh, let me just... The outer core? Oh, hang on. Now you got me thinking about it. You're talking about the sp uh, spreading zone, where uh, um, mid-oceanic mid ridge is what we commonly oh, refer to it. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the mantle. Um, yeah. You see it there? Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't remember it. I just because I'm getting old. Because I'm, yeah. I'm getting old, my, my vocabulary is gone to shit. Um, yeah, I was having the same trouble. The asthenosphere is part of the mantle. Is it? Yeah, it's one of the layers. Ah, uh, okay. 
I just looked. Ah. Uh, so Charlie says that there are studies you can find that have demonstrated the magnetic sense in birds. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, I know that's early work. And I think, you know, um, all kind, who knows how many species rely on the Earth's magnetic field. We can definitely say, I think with a lot of confidence, that the Earth's magnetic field is vital to our being here. Um, I would put it as the single most important thing, even over the atmosphere, because I think it's more important than having an atmosphere. Although we can't live without an atmosphere either. If we're going to rank what's more important, I think, you know, life could maybe be, could maybe conceivably start uh, without a magnetic field, maybe for a while and then go, uh, but it couldn't thrive and it wouldn't last uh, without the magnetic field that get killed. Uh, pretty quickly, especially if it's around any kind of active star. Um, but uh, and Venus is uh, it doesn't have a, a magnetosphere, and it has an atmosphere. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to live there. That's a good point. And, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny when we talk about finding exoplanets and looking for other planets like the Earth. Uh, if mm -hmm. one were to find a, a planet, first, finding a planet with an atmosphere is going to be a big challenge. JWST will help with that. Uh, and then you take a spectrum of that uh, atmosphere, the light passing through the atmosphere, and you can measure what's in it. Uh, and you can say, oh, goody, there's oxygen in there and all kinds of other fun things. But you could also say that if you'd looked at Venus from a very distant space telescope, you'd see something different. Now, or you'd, you know, you would, you, you'd see the same thing. But obviously, Venus can't have life. So, yeah, uh, we get. I, I can imagine we're getting really excited after JWST is launched, and, and we start looking at these exoplanets. Oh, it's got an atmosphere! Woohoo! Yay! Oh, it's got oxygen! Woohoo! Yay! It's got a bunch of other things! Woohoo! Yay! But we don't. Well, know I don't know if, if, uh, anything, if a we don't life know if surface can be made out or anything lead. like that that would find ah. uh, life on on that. You know, was it habitable? Yeah. And of course, I could be finding Venus for that matter. Go ahead, Peter. Um, can um, life forms uh, be made out of lead? And then we would have possible life on Venus. It's far-fetched, but, you know, you can see where I'm thinking. You can have some sort of high-temperature uh, chemistry rather than the low-temperature, well, whatever you call our temperature yeah. chemistry. Yeah. Yeah, sure. A lot. We're, we're highly evolved to match our environment, and it's very difficult for us to think of evolution to match other environments. And I don't yeah. think people okay, appreciate that enough. You know, I, I don't think people really, that's a point that I find critical in talking about going elsewhere in the universe, because we were evolved to be here. And even, mm -hmm. not even everywhere here, right? We don't see everybody living on the top of Mount Everest, although they go there, they couldn't live there. You don't see, you don't see people living in, well, I guess you see them living in the Sahara Desert, but, but it's not exactly habitable is my point. It's not exactly friendly for life. And so we don't even live everywhere here on earth where we could be. So it's, it's, we're very highly evolved to a very specific yeah. set of conditions that really only exist here so far. And I don't think people appreciate that enough. That's a really good point, Mike. I appreciate you bringing that up. I say it all the time. You know, we need to be here. And if we go anywhere else, we need to bring here exactly as it is with us or else we're not going to mm -hmm. do well. But some of us, I mean, I think I'm much less susceptible to being stuck indoors all the time. It doesn't bother me at all. I walk around the house. I watch yeah. the internet. I... Many days I don't go out of the house at all. Sometimes for several days in a row. Much like me. Little different than not having the option at all. Yeah. Uh, psychologically, yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't dispute that we can do this, that we can build ourselves domes on Mars that we could live in and never go out of and be just fine. I, I think it'll mess with us uh, in our psychology and it will mess with our biology in the sense of the gravity and all the other things that, that, you know, affect low gravity environments. Cause you can't like, unless you're going to make a rotating Taurus or something on the surface of Mars, you're going to be lo looking at less gravity, but I don't. So I think, you know, I don't want to argue that we can't do that. We absolutely could. We could live there for years at a time, but to never come home again 
and to never be able to go outside without something on, uh, suits, uh, shielding of some kind, vehicles, whatever it is, that's going to mess with us, man. More than when I think we think it will. Uh, you know, we could say, oh, yeah, you know, harumph, 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 I can be strong. I can do this. I'm an explorer. I can take it. I can take it. Well, this is more than being yeah. an explorer. You're not coming back. Even Geordies aren't that hardy. <laughs> That's right. Even Geordies would put yeah. on a coat on Mars. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's a different situation. I agree. There are times when, you know, it's weather, bad weather out. You're You're stuck inside for a week or two. But are you saying, Mike, that you never get cabin fever, that you never, you would be fine just staying in your house the whole time? Or do you ever just want to go out for a walk? No, I'm quite happy just walking in the house and listening to something on headphones or something like that. Since You know, I lived by myself. My wife died years ago. Children have moved away. Um, and I've slowly sort of adapted, I think, to, you know, talking to people online, reading a lot, listening to a lot of, podcasts and things and i've never been very interested in gardening i'm not a very athletic person um i've recently developed a some sort of allergy to sunlight which makes it a nuisance to go outside i have to put on sun cream and do you live in um, england you know things like that or do you live in england Yes. Oh, well, then you don't have to worry about the sun too much. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, there wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, oh, then you would be a good candidate, I would say. Uh, to go well, I think I would. I, the trouble is I don't like camping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would be one hell of a camp trip, wouldn't it? <laughs> I love it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It would be one hell of a camping trip for sure. My question yeah. is I don't know if you'd get back. Uh, you know, I don't know if you could come back after, say, several years on Mars. What would be the effect of your bone density, your muscle mass, all of this stuff? Uh, what would what, yeah. would you always have to be in a constant state of preparation to return home or else you couldn't return home? I, I'd like to know the answer to that. Um, the shielding and, and all of that, yes, those can all be workarounds with technology. Um But I still think that that's going to mess with us in the head more than we think it will. And imagine being, okay, so you're, you're fine doing it in the house by yourself, walking around, putting on headphones and doing your research, whatever it is you're doing in the house. But imagine doing it around a bunch of other people, some of whom you don't like, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, you don't get along with, you know, I mean, that's, it could be hell then. Um, and what if someone starts deteriorating <laughs> mentally, even though they show up, they're very strong mentally, but they get out there and they start freaking out and they become impossible for all it takes is one person to really, I mean, anybody yeah. who's ever been in a, in an internet chat knows it just takes one person to ruin it for everybody. So, you know, that's a different situation. And you can, you can look at that, uh, by what they had at the, uh, overwintering. And that's only like, uh, what, three or six months. Uh, that they're overwintering and it, it, it you have to be the right type of person to go there in the first place or at least uh, pass uh, pass the some kind of psychological evaluation that says yeah you're suited for that and it's hard on some people yeah right uh, it, it uh, i think it's easier when you have uh, at least a, a a group that is uh, that is large, like i think that they've uh got something like uh, uh two dozen or more overwintering but it's a skeleton crew right yeah but, and they they keep going and it's well not quite six months i mean but uh, when the sun when the sun goes down the sun goes down and it's and, and that's the closest we have here on earth to that kind of environment and yeah. they do that they've they, they've continuously inhabited uh, the south pole for a long time and I, I mean it's not that we can't do it but i think we need like the vast majority of us are not suited for that no i suspect that we choose the wrong sort of people to be astronauts at the moment for wanting people who would survive in that sort of environment they tend to be very athletic, very outgoing um, and they people have who have hobbies like climbing mountains and um, 
I uh-huh. don't want to ski hang and goodness knows what. Right. And you yeah. want people who can respond. The astronauts we've picked, at least in the past, have been very good at responding to emergencies, being able to have a clear head in the middle of a, of, of, uh, you know, emergency situations. Personal crisis. You know, yeah. They, they keep their head, they keep their cool. Um, they've been trained for that. You know, it's why t- that's why test pilots were such a big deal early on is because they knew if something went wrong, mm-hmm. they weren't going to freak out and panic. You're right though. For a colonist or even a, somebody who's just going to be over there doing research for several years requires a totally different kind of person um, to be able to, to make it through that. And, and, you know, all I'm saying is I don't think <laughs> we're thinking about this enough. We're just so excited to get to Mars we're not thinking about the what it really means to be away from Earth. No one's ever done it before. Uh, mm. The space station is not a good example. Um, we're hours away. You're nestled in the magnetosphere. Not a good example. We need better examples. Go to the moon and live for five years and tell me you can do Mars. Then, then I might be, you know, a little bit more optimistic about this. I just wish we had done, we do more thinking about it. Um, I, I think our heads, and, our psyche is... Uh, and right. there I, I've i found a positive to all of the rich people going into space because they're not trained as well as ordinary astronauts, many of whom have never, ever actually been on a climbing trip or things like that. They're more yeah, normal everyday people apart from the fact that they're, they're rich yeah and big egos yeah Oops. and then we can test them to see if they have any adverse mental effects <laughs> yeah let's use the let's use the uh billionaire although shatner seems to have a po- positive mental effect yeah but he was up there for minutes so yeah, yeah, yeah I but know. all right. So okay, I'm gonna you, have to. Close you see out, his reaction. I'm gonna have to close out the screen, uh, the stream here, and just. Uh-huh. I just want to point out this. Uh, this is a good um, comment from PB about uh, uh, radiation load in space is huge. Um, so we have to keep that in mind uh, when going to another, um, another world that is outside of. Uh, mm-hmm. the earth okay well we talked about several things here today we talked about both the uh, magnetic field flipping as well as uh, living somewhere like mars that doesn't have a magnetic field um so uh next thursday please join again the dart team is going to be around we're going to learn about dart some more even though i told you about dart in a basic sense then we're going to have the guests on hand to talk about it specifically and um so please be around thursday three o'clock for that uh that's mm-hmm. sponsored by the american astronautical society going and watching these hangouts you're supporting deep astronomy just by being there um and uh and i do appreciate it so anyway so thank you guys uh peter michael hans uh huh? tony all you guys thank you guys for joining i appreciate the Thanks, uh, tony. the interaction this is getting funner with everyone more and more we're building. We're building a nice little community here. Mm-hmm. So let's keep it going. See you guys on Thursday. On Tuesday, I'll be talking about um, I'll be talking about the decadal survey. Also, just real quick, I know I got to go. Uh, the uh, the next uh, episode of Space Junk Podcast will be posted tomorrow. I'm editing it now. So Destin and I recorded right. it on Friday. So that's coming back as well. Thank you all so much for watching, listening, and interacting. And I'll see you guys next time. And as always. Keep looking. Keep up. looking up. Keep looking up. That's right. Nice, Jordi. Thank Thanks. you, Tony. Thanks, Tony. You're welcome. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you, Tony. Oh, you're welcome.